Yeah, shipmates, thank you for joining me at Bert's Books, where this time we are going to be taking a dive, a plunge, into the world of the uh, Sharkwall novels, the sequels to uh, Peter Benchley's Jaws, and of course, running on from the Steven Spielberg film of the same title. Now, what is a film studio supposed to do when it finds a surprise summer blockbuster on its hands? Uh, do you take a risk on diversifying into new, original and exciting projects? Or do you go back to the well and churn out a sequel in the hope that you can continue to ride that wave? Uh, keep watching for further clumsily mixed metaphors. Now, Steven Spielberg's original film, um, arguably an ichthyological riff on the Moby Dick theme, was based on Peter Benchley's 1974 novel uh, and was an astonishing success story. Jaws broke box office records within weeks of its release and received critical accolades to go with it. Uh, while the respective plots of the film and the book uh, differ in some areas, uh, they both work fine as standalones. Um, there doesn't seem to be many significant loose ends in either that would call for the story's continuation. However, it only took a small taste of the first film's success to convince Universal that a sequel was required. Um, Steven Spielberg seems at that point to have felt that he'd said all he needed to say on the subject of sharks, and so John D. Hancock was originally engaged to direct, uh, with a provisional plot being worked up by Howard Sattler, who'd had some involvement in the first film. Supposedly this was originally pitched as being a prequel uh, concerning Quint's naval experiences which were formative in his subsequent uh, kill-them-all attitude towards sharks as a species. However, the development and realisation of the second film was a notoriously troubled process which involved a change of director to jean Spark, a change of plot to a chronological sequel uh, with a script being heavily revised by Carl Gottlieb. The eventual, and some may say inevitable, novelisation was based on an intermediate Howard Sackler Dorothy Tristan screenplay and was handled by veteran TV writer Hank Searles, whose previous novels included The Crowded Sky and The Penetrators, both of which had successfully received the cinematic treatment. Now, I've got to hold my hand up to a certain level of bias here, um, as at a, quite a young age, I bought this novel the first time around. This was my first exposure to the franchise. I'd been far too young to have seen the film, and I hadn't read the Benchley book. Um, I don't remember either film being televised in the UK until sometime in the 80s, although Action Comic had obliged my age group um, with the heavily influenced and rather controversial Hookjaw story. My first copy was the, the other version of this, uh, the version with the girl and the yellow bikini which uh, admittedly uh, sort of caught my interest at that age but bikini girl apart um, I remember being instantly hooked no pun intended by Searle's writing he leads us in with a description of the marine environment that emphasizes an eerie kind of loneliness um, there's a pair of aging scuba divers co-owners of the powerboat Miss Carriage that went above my head at the time. They're contemplating their annual spring dive with a level of enthusiasm that's been diminishing by the year. They're clearly diving partners rather than friends. Uh, we don't learn either's name. Um, and the one we're introduced to is the Doctor sneakily glugging a few shots of bourbon down to get his courage up. He clearly doesn't relish the prospect, dimly aware as he is of that part of the coast's recent phantoms, uh, namely the rogue great white shark that famously terrorised this area area two years previously and which lurks at the edge of his consciousness. Meanwhile we're made aware that they're far from alone within this stretch of the ocean. Uh, a large female great white, gravid from a frenzied interaction with uh, the possessor of two yard long salami shaped claspers belonging to guess who a couple of years previously uh, i'm going on the assumption that searles did his homework on shark biology although um, wikipedia gives that species an 11 month gestation period confusingly anyway she's not eaten since a cod feast off nantucket uh, and for a mile ahead of her uh, the other wildlife's sensory apparatus are warning them to give her a wide berth Humans, of course, have lost all such faculties, though our doctor is feeling decidedly twitchy, even given the level of old grandad that is swimming around in his veins. And it's a feeling that's amplified once he and his partner chance across the wreck of the orca, a shattered hulk against which a shackled buoyancy drum bangs listlessly, producing an ominous bell-like report. 
our doctor's instincts prove to be correct as a threatening bulk appears out of nowhere, illuminated momentarily by the misfiring flash of his companion, the lawyer's undersea camera. When the silk clears, there's only the sound of the clanging drum and no sign of the lawyer. Uh, the doctor stays in a sheltered position until his air is about to give out, and believing the coast to be clear, he cautiously surfaces to find himself about a hundred feet from the boat, uh, with the reassuring sight of the houses on the dunes about a kilometre behind. He slowly makes for safety, but his warning systems begin to kick in again, and he begins to panic before, at about 20 feet from the boat, a firm grasp on his left femur halts his progress. Believing his companion to have somehow survived and grabbed him for attention, he dips his mask into the water, only to witness a neoprene-clad leg tumbling mesmerisingly into the depths. He feels nothing but a weird sense of apathy and even ponders a quick snooze despite the subway roar that approaches uh, and he's violently borne aloft, his last sensations being of a vast compression of his vital organs and then oblivion. Now, revisiting this book after many years, I'm struck by what an enduringly great opening uh, that Searles has executed here. It's a curiously unsensationalised treatment of extreme human trauma, and it sets you up for a novel that's an infinitely more satisfying prospect than uh, than the ho-hum kind of 6 out of 10 experience that the film turned out to be. From here, we're whisked back ashore to where Brody, who's kind of an old friend, if you've seen or read the original, uh, is going about his day-to-day -day duty. Years on from the difficult period that's universally known throughout this coastal town amity as the trouble Brody continues his work as a small town police chief in his characteristically unshowy fashion and while the film channels the story into a kind of aquatic slasher teen drama the book focuses much more on Brody's precarious navigation of small town politics in a backwater that's taken a severe economic hit in recent years and whose civic administration which is personified by one of fiction's more memorable douchebags Mayor Larry Vaughan are anxious enough to attract outside investment into their diminishing community to turn a blind eye when that investment comes in the form of mafia money. Now the signs that a revisitation of their sharp troubles are there, firstly with the disappearance of our two diving partners and secondly an incident in which our water skiing lady um, disappears and the boat pulling her mysteriously explodes just off the beach, um, a projectile having holed its fuel tank. Uh, but these are ambiguous enough for them to be attributed to other causes, but such is the lack of uh, moral compass in the Vaughan administration that when Brody becomes admired in tricky politics after pulling in an off-duty cop that he first suspects might be responsible for the latter incident. Brody is pressured to drop the matter uh, against his professional scruples in the fear that the politics surrounding it will jeopardise investment into Amity. On top of all this, Brody is having to negotiate certain issues on the home front. In keeping with the Benchley book, there's a detectable tension within his marriage, his wife Ellen having indulged in a short fling with Hooper in the first book, and a ballistics expert who's been helping Brody with his inquiries on the speed boat uh, catches his eye somewhat. Meanwhile both his sons are trying to deal with the residual trauma of the first book's events and his eldest Mike, uh, who's been cruelly nicknamed Spitzer by his contemporaries, uh, Mark Spitz, is struggling to confront a very understandable fear of going into the water. Firstly by dabbling in yachtsmanship, uh, an activity which his younger brother Sean is eager to get involved, and secondly by enlisting into the local scuba diving club, a move which his uh, protective dad is none too keen on. The mafioso subplot is also a prominent feature of this book, manifested in the shape of uh, the Ferrari driving Flash Harry Shuffles Moscotti, um, who's looking to piggyback the mob into this quiet backwater by the way of the town official and real estate developer Pete Peterson with his casino project. In the meantime, town pharmacist Nate Starbuck is suddenly desperate to shift his own piece of real estate. He's been entrusted with the development of the film from the recovered diver's camera. The sly old bastard has realised before anyone that the town's troubles have returned and is using that information to his own advantage. 
Meanwhile, the shark, as its birthing time nears, uh, is becoming increasingly frantic to feed, uh, even chomping down on a US Navy sonar ball, uh, bringing down the operating helicopter in the process. Uh, the Navy are concerned enough about this expensive piece of equipment, uh, never mind the helicopter crew, to offer a bounty for its location and its retrieval. Um, this causes Mike's maiden voyage with into the ocean environment at Tom Andrews Diving Club uh, to end in a near tragedy for one of its participants. So these various plot strands draw us towards the inevitable concluding standoff between Brody, who's again willing to put himself in harm's way, and the shark. The conclusion is slightly different and yet pretty much recognisable uh, to that of the film. But yet while the film is generally held as a sort of OK, passable 6 out of 10 at best kind of job, the book tends to be uh, acknowledged far more as the rightful sequel to the first. The book is far more involving and multifaceted, and its underlying downbeat tone, uh, the backdrop of a town that's taken an economic hit as a result of shark activity and is struggling to recover from that, and makes it a far more credible proposition than the kind of teen slasher with fins type of affair that the second film morphed into. If this book has one flaw, it's this, that the ending writes in the possibility or even the likelihood of further sequels. Fatal. Now, as for Jaws 3, or Jaws 3D, I've not been able to unearth any evidence that this one was ever novelised. Uh, I'm willing to be proved wrong on that, uh, but in any case, just think what a great pop-up book it might have turned out to be. It's doubly surprising, then, to learn that Jaws 4 was... <laughs> A film so bad I've never got further than the first 10 minutes into it was novelised, and again by Hank Searles. Now, given the fact that this is widely held up as a landmark in shitty films, you wonder how much damage limitation a writer can realistically be expected to achieve. Dare we hope that he might have worked a miracle here? Well, not really, but given what he's got to work with... By this stage, there's little reason for even the most ardent Jaws fan uh, to feel involved with the storyline. And besides, the book is littered with flashbacks to Jaws 2. Uh, Brody's gone, dead, driven to an early demise, supposedly by lingering shark-related stress. <laughs> now, the oddness of that premise has been commented on many times. He's seen off the two biggest, baddest, great white sharks in existence, and yet rather than set himself up as the Buffalo Bill of Sharks, instead he's wasted away from shark paranoia. This leaves Ellen with her now grown-up kids. Sean has inherited his dad's vocation as a local cop, while Mike has become, what else, a marine biologist. Anyhow, Sean is called out on duty one foggy night just before Christmas to haul a loose piling out of the channel. And you can probably guess how that ends up. It's another damn shark. And it got Sean. It got little Sean. The problem is, it's just really difficult to give a shit by this point. Sorry. It's taken four films and four different sharks for one of them to sink its teeth into a brody. Mike and his wife head up for the funeral, and Ellen promptly tries to talk Mike out of doing any more diving, because she knows in her bones that the shark has somehow got it in for the Brodies. This is how it's marketed. The revenge. This time, it's personal. Anyhow, she's persuaded to get away from it all, to go and join Mike and family down in the Bahamas for Christmas, where she's ferried about by the lovable rascal island-hopping charter pilot, Hoagie Newcomb, the character played rather perplexingly by a sleepwalking Michael Caine in the film. Of course, the shark stalks her, all the way down to the Bahamas. This unlikely migration seems to be attributed, uh, in the book at least, to the power of voodoo, which is called into play by a local Abaya man who's got a grudge against Mike and family by the name of Papa Jack, which I'll buy over the notion of a shark family feud, as postulated by Ellen. So anyway, a bunch of silly old bollocks ensues, a, a subplots encompassing tropical gangster dope smuggling action and modern sculpture. Another formidable great white loses its place at the apex of the food chain uh, thanks to uh, Brody family pluck. But it's all a bit unnecessary really. The most significant difference between this and the film 
is that uh, I could get through this, not with anything like the same level of involvement and enjoyment as Jaws 2, but to his credit, Searle, um, if he doesn't transform this into a silk purse, he gets you through it, more or less. Ultimately, though, this is just curiosity or kitsch value only. The Jaws franchise loses any semblance of being worthwhile the moment that Martin Brody drops out of the plot. In the absence of any significant unresolved business from the first film, perhaps the main justification for even the second is Brody's likability. He's wonderfully realised in both films by Roy Scheider uh, as an unshowy kind of every man, every cop type of hero. Um, he's not Dirty Harry, he's not Charles Bronson, he's a largely unextraordinary small town cop he has his flaws he has his vulnerabilities but he somehow manages to achieve great things when he's placed in an extraordinary situation and if there's any justification at all for a continuation from the first book or the first film, it's that perhaps we can tolerate getting to know Martin Brody a little better. If there's any worthwhile development in the Jaws canon from the first, I'd say that it's Hank Searle's novel here, with or without the Bikini Girl. Incidentally, it's worth pointing out that later in his life, Peter Benchley may be somewhat regretful at the negative perception of sharks from his uh, original novel, he became quite a prominent champion of uh, shark protection. As he's now more uh, broadly publicly aware, humans aren't really that high in the uh, order of a shark's favourite dishes. The exception being, of course, whether it's harbouring a deep personal resentment against your family or that it's been instructed to attack you by a voodoo man. Sharks come and go, Ellen. People have got nothing to do with it. Give it a kick in the 